It is an honor to have you here in this forum. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Vandenberg. Um, against the background of the economic crisis going on, in spe especially in the Western world, we see that uh, first cuts are made in the domain of arts and culture. What are the consequences, especially in your domain, uh, film production? And how can politicians uh, be convinced to not just talk, uh, but actually act? Well, to answer to the second part of the question, um, Especially for the Middle East, there are a lot of very bad examples, a lot of very bad examples of countries who do not consider culture, and especially film, even though it is so powerful, um, an important thing to build up, uh, either, uh, either after a war or even in a peace situation. But some of them are starting to realize that, um, that film and other cultural industries can become exactly that, can, can become cultural industries. Um, let me just make you think for one second about one point. Um, the Americans, Hollywood, call themselves the film industry. So the two components here, film, creativity, invention, and so on, industry, economics, mm -hmm. money, profit, mm -hmm. business, and so on. They have managed, and this is one of the main reasons for the Americans dominating today's cultural, uh, let's say, cultural industry in the world, they have managed to put these two things together. Some countries in my field of expertise, in, or let's say in, in, the, in the area that I'm most interested in, which is the Middle East, some countries are starting to realize that they can do that by themselves and that they cannot, that they do not have to rely on foreign uh, powers or foreign intelligentsia or foreign input mm -hmm. to do this. Um, and let me make the example of Jordan. Jordan is, let me say it in a very, uh, a little bit sloppy way, Jordan is what is left over after Sykes-Picot divided the Arab world into the French part and the British part. Mm -hmm. So there was this thing in the middle, Transjordania, that was left over because there's no oil there. So it's a nation that is extremely um, resource poor, but that are extremely resourceful in terms of um, services, uh, tertiary business, and so on. The Jordanians have been, they have two, three, big locations, great locations that have been used by the film industry since the early 50s. Um, everybody will remember Lawrence of Arabia, mm -hmm. which is a three and a half epos mm -hmm. about, you know, Lawrence T, Lawrence uh, called of Arabia, which was almost entirely shot in the Jordanian desert of Wadi Ram, which is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful landscape. After that film, many, many others, four or five dozen others, until Brian De Palma's uh, science fiction epos uh, about Mars, I think it was called, not Life on Mars, but Mission to Mars, I think it was Brian De Palma's film, have been shot in Jordan, but they have used Jordan as a location. So, at a certain point, the Jordanians realized that if that continued, Jordan was going to be used only as a location, and their resources, their human resources and their physical resources, were only be used for that film, for that film, for that film, but there was no education, there was no progress, and there was nothing like that. So they started about 10, 12 years ago to create two, two very important things. A film commission, mm -hmm. meaning to, promote, to continue promoting the country as a location and to attract people coming from the outside, and at the same time an academy. An academy that gives young people, not only from Jordan, but mo mainly from Jordan and from other countries of the Middle East, the possibility to learn on in a program which is free, which is sponsored after you have to, of, of course you have to qualify, it's like the system of the academies in, uh, in Europe. And um, after three years you get a master's degree and then um, you have another extra year and in that extra year as a grip person, a light person, a camera person, whatever, you can work on a major film or, let's say, on a film. That program has been going on for six, seven years now, and it has really changed a lot of things in Jordan. The Jordanians have realized, and they have created the infrastructure with the education, 
um, that the movie business can become not only creativity, but they can they can also have a huge economic importance. That it can create income that is not imported from outside, but that is created inside the country. And this year, for the first time, 2012, for the first time, they even have established a film fund. The, it's the first and only country in uh, the entire Middle East that has a proper film fund, if you exclude um, um, Dubai, of course. But, you know, Dubai is a different thing because Dubai is so incredibly rich that they can do whatever they want. You know, that, that is not really that. So, how can politicians be convinced? They can be convinced with examples like that. They can be convinced um, that their input is not input that is going to be burned and um, produce films that will be like screened two times or three times or four times for an audience of 12 people, but that it, that it can create income. And that is what makes politicians say, income? Interesting. That, and that system works. It works everywhere in the world where you have the chance to tell politicians that in other countries the system has been applied very successfully. Now, Iraq, for example, is a country where this will take a long time. In order to make this happen and to make this become successful, you have to work. If you're not willing to do that, no chance. Mm -hmm. you, you have to, for one year, two years, three years, even five years, you have to invest in that. And if you don't, it will not happen. Okay. Um, you have produced, produced films with, uh, with and in the Middle East that have had problems with the screening. What are your thoughts about freedom of expression, especially in the Arab world, in issues such as religion or women's sexu sexuality? How can those boundaries be broken? Um, it's actually not that we had have, that we had problems with the screening. We had problems with the uh, with the with the producing of the films. Um, we um, very briefly, because otherwise it would be a long story. Um, I started my production company, which is based here in Berlin, uh, Outremer Film which takes the name from the old French term for, you know, the land beyond the sea, which is, you know, uh, Israel, Palestine, the Middle East in general, with a film that was centered on uh, female sexuality in the Arab world. Uh, we started to do this film, and we did this film, we centered it on Damascus, because in Damascus there is, surprisingly, um, a 70-year tradition of raunchy, extremely sexy underwear that, that is produced in the back rooms of the stores and so on. You know, they, they sell the usual underwear and so on, but they also sell this stuff that is much more red light district, you know, with uh, panties and vibrators and stuff like that. And, but this is not like micro production of three pieces or four pieces. This is m massive production of these, of these things, of these kinky th um, one of the shop owners told me when I was there for the first time, um, he just had invented a specific kind of thong with a specific kind of thing at a very specific position and so on, that this thing became so popular, so popular in the Gulf region that, all, that in Qatar alone they sold 36,000 pieces <laughs> of that item, only of that item. So you can imagine the, the, the rest of yeah. the production. So um, in summer, and slightly before Ramadan, um, women f flock, used to flock and used to come, now of course not because you have a war situation, to Damascus, to the souk of Damascus and to, you know, look at these things because there are no websites of course for that, very, very few, because photographs like that would be considered almost pornographic, so, which is a very good excuse for these women who normally leave their cousin or you know the male uh, the, the male who is with them and who has to go with them at the bus station at the rail station whatever it is and they they go into downtown and they and they look at these things and they choose them and they order them the problem that we ha that we had faced is that 
sexuality not only in, in, in the Arab communities, not only in the Arab societies, even in secular countries like Syria, is something that usually nobody talks about because it, it happens behind the closed door. So it is something that is not public. It is not destined to be talked about in public life. You can talk about it personally and everybody will open, or let's say the people that, that, that are a little more open-minded, they will, once they realize that you, that you don't want to you know, exploit in them, they talk to you quite openly. But in the very second that you switch on a camera, it's over. Because, of course, they realize that this is going to be destined to public viewing, to screening, to broadcasting, and so on and so on. So we managed to find, in Syria, women from very different classes, from very different social backgrounds, um, who for three, four months thought about if they were willing to talk about this with us. And it took us really some convincing to do that. When we finally started doing it, after three weeks, we realized that the Ministry of Information in Syria was very aware of what we were doing, although we were trying to keep everything under the radar. Um, my theory is that we had one guy on our team who was like the secret informer and so on. But you know, things like that, Damascus is very big, but then it's very small also. Things like that, if they happen, they spread very, very, very rapidly. So basically, after four weeks, we got our cameras confiscated and uh, we got um, a visit by some very nice gentlemen who told us that uh, our presence in the country uh, was uh, pretty much uh, appreciated, but that we should please uh, refrain from doing things that are undecent for Syrian society. We thought about what to do and um, for some day, and we called our contacts, our interview partners, and so on, and we asked them about, do we go ahead? Do you want to go ahead? Or do we not go ahead? And from that moment on, for two and a half weeks, almost three weeks, we did clandestine encounters and clandestine interviews. Uh, we, phoned, uh, we, 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 we filmed them with iPhones, we filmed them with small cameras and so on. And the interviews that, 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 that were created in that phase are much more powerful because, of course, they're, they're, they're loaded with, you know, with more energy. In, in that case, negative energy, but more energy. And then, on our 24th day of shooting, the war started, and we were literally, literally thrown out of the country. So, no, we did not encounter censorship in the Middle East, but we encountered huge difficulties in terms of social pressure towards the people that who we were talking uh, to. Um, sometimes from their families, sometimes from their friends. Amazingly, let me just add this, not to make it too long, amazingly, the lower on the social level we got, the more natural the people were, and the less difficult it became for us to talk, which is very strange, because usually in, you know, in a social environment like families and so on, it's exactly the opposite. The more educated people are, uh, the more they know um, that this is important and so on. It's really exactly the opposite, uh, the opposite experience. It might have been chance, it might have been by chance, but I'm not entirely convinced that it was. But it's an open project, we still have to continue it because we have like a half-finished film. So. Sounds really interesting. Um, if you, want, if you want me to add one thing, my last experience, um, that was an experience of censorship. We were in, I was in Kashmir um, this summer, and um, we were filming, we were sent to Kashmir by a German-French television uh, broadcasting channel, Arte, um, to do a piece about the Dal Lake and about the beauty of the Kashmir Valley and so on and so on. So what we found out in the Kashmir Valley is that the Dal Lake is, is extremely polluted, which is common knowledge. The Dal Lake has been extremely polluted almost for 15 years. The thing is, we found out with several people, asking several people, also officials who you know talked under the uh, uh, 
uh, secrecy and so on and so on, um, that the Kashmiri government, which is a government that is split into two pieces and so on and so on, the Kashmiri government had was doing a little bit about that, but not so much, and that they didn't really save the lake, even though they had economically all the means to do that, for a very simple reason. They're getting 14.6 million dollars every year from the international community in order to um, control the pollution on the lake and to save the lake. So if they did save it, that money wouldn't come anymore as simple as that. When we discovered that and when we got more information about that and when we got more proof that this is probably was probably the, the, the real thing, um, again we were confiscated, we had our cameras confiscated and we were told that we were pleased to make um, our images and focus our images on the beauty of Kashmir and so on and so on and so on. But I guess that, that something like that could happen to you today in Russia, in Kashmir, in Syria, almost everywhere in the world. It could probably even happen to you in Canada if you, if you plan to do a film about the way they extract oil of the, uh, you know, of the sands in Canada. A friend of mine actually had that experience. So, in short answer, censorship, I think, and restrictions not only of the press, but of, of, of expression, is something that can happen to you everywhere, even in the so-called democracies. Um, during this conference, we talked a lot about uh, how to deal with the multicultural society that is a reality today in our environment. This is closely interlinked with the question of identity and how we define ourselves towards each other and how we deal with different identities. Um, as a filmmaker and according to your uh, experience, why do you think the question of difference of identities is a conflict and how can we overcome it? Wow, <laughs> my compliments to whoever put up that question. This is difficult to answer and it's difficult even to understand exactly what you mean by that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an academic, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a filmmaker, I studied some stuff, but I'm not a scientist, so... The question of difference of identities as a conflict... Well, let me turn the question around. Is conflict always bad? I think conflict is not always bad, not only that. Let me, let me turn it around even more. Um, <laughs> And I hope that it's not too simplistic as an answer. The films that you will probably remember most, or the books that you probably remember most of your life, are probably not the books where the story is plain and nothing really happens and everything is beautiful and then at the very end, yes, they get together and they marry and they live happily ever after. The books that you probably remember are the books where you have conflict and where the conflict is resolved only after a big struggle of the protagonist against the antagonist and so on and so on. Take, uh, I don't know, take The uh, take the Hobbit now, take uh, 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 the Tolkien trilogy and so on. It's always evil against good. Evil against good is interesting. Evil against good um, brings out the best in, in all of us in terms of um, resolution of, of even our own conflicts that we transport through the protagonist if the protagonist is, is well enough designed and well enough made up. So my answer to that is, um, or let's say a partial answer at, at least, um, difference of identities I think has to be a conflict because if it wasn't conflictuous, if I wasn't if I was the same kind, if I had the same kind of identity and the same kind of conviction, even though I grew up uh, with uh, in a democratic system and so on, as I don't know, a uh, a young boy or a guy who lives in Afghanistan or in Park or in Pakistan or somebody in Indonesia, or somebody in Australia. Um, there wouldn't be any different identities. We would all all be the same. It would be George Orwell's perfect system, you know. All everybody is like schooled and trained in in, in, in the same way. Um, so we cannot overcome it. And honestly, we shall not overcome it. Because it is really important, not only that 
simplistically people keep their own identities, but it is also very important that we realize that the conflict between us and others is not a negative thing. It is something that we can all learn from. They can learn from it, we can learn from it. We only, the only thing is Europeans, Westerners tend to, and we spoke about this today, tend to try to convince the other that their system and their way of thinking, their identity in this case, is the best way. And it is not. Honestly, it's not. It's not. And I'm not only convinced that it's not, but um, if you really think about it, and if you think about it in a non-political way, you must conclude that if everybody were like you, and we will all be clones of you. Would that be any more f any fun in life? Would that be interesting? So. <laughs> if everybody was like you, I mean, no, sure. I mean, everybody would be much more beautiful than I am. Of course, that's true. But it's this is not what makes us, you know, interesting as people. Right. You know, it's it it's the simple question. You have to have black and white. If you have only white you can't see what the black is. If you have only black, you can't see what the white is. So you have to have both of them. And it's good that both of them are there. Sorry for the, too, for, for the long answer, but this is... I had to think about the question. It's actually tricky. <laughs> it's very really tricky, yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much for taking your time and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. But it makes the contrast evident, you know, if it's if, if everything is grey, you have a lot of variations of black and white in terms of, you know, colour pigments, colour pigmentation. You have white, you have black, and you have the space in between that, that creates the grey, but you don't really see the difference. If you have black and white, you can't see the difference, and the contrast becomes evident. Democracy mm -hmm. is grey. Not all democracies are the same. All of them are different. That is true. Uh, let me let me say, democracy is great for you because you're used to um, access and to think about democracies um, in the Western world, and you can diversify between that kind of democracy and that kind of democracy and so on and so on. So the middle ground that you find out that is probably the way to go for you seems great. Talk to um, an Afghan freedom fighter who was a Mujahideen uh, during, the so uh, during the fight against the Soviets and talk to him about democracy. For him, democracy is purely white or purely black because it is something so opposed and so contra contrary to what he believes in. Or even, even, even let's say, a less, a less dramatic example. Talk, uh, talk to a Bedouin in the Maghreb or a Bedouin in the south of Jordan or in the southeast of uh, southwest of, of Saudi Arabia about democracy, he will he will not even understand what you're saying. Yeah, he doesn't know what you're talking about. He doesn't know. He doesn't it know is. because his world in his world it is not a concept. He, he can't think it. He doesn't have a word for it. You know, this is why for me it's not grayish. It's grayish here, but it's black and white over there. Definitely black and white. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs>